All right, so today's topic is intellectual property. And you have a worksheet that will help you <clears throat> with some notes on that. And I do have some worksheets to return. Even though they may not be super helpful. The one you did a lot of writing on. That These are more of a check off generally that rather than trying to get a few on participation in the test, you can kind of look at this. Hey, I think you fill in the worksheet. It kind of counts as an attendance as well as a designated online computer. I'm hoping those will just help you. For me, when I write things down, it keeps me, helps me keep my attention and reviewing later is always helpful. <coughs> Even if it's just a spurious scan over what you did, to me that helps to stick in my mind. It's always better. That's just Okay, so intellectual property. What is intellectual property? And uh, even more, what's the, what would you call it, what's the, what's the ethical reasons to protect it? Why is it right or wrong to protect or not to protect intellectual property? This chapter doesn't so much talk about the ethics of why we have intellectual property, and why ideas should belong to someone. Uh, that was uh, somewhat of, if that, that, to me that's always interesting to kind of think of what, why has it become something uh, that laws have been made for it? You know, what, what's the ethics behind it? You know, should, I, should a person have a right of ownership for their, just their ideas? What's the, what's the big deal? How, how would you... How would you describe the, the reason to have intellectual property protection? What do you think? Yeah, so let, yeah, we, I guess we better get back to that, to that definition of it first. Yeah, I, I forgot to go forward to the slide. Let's let's see what it is, and then let's think about why why is it important to protect. So let's think about this, and basically the, the chapter is going to go over this kind of thing as well as copyright and trade secret. Talk about plagiarism. That's a big deal with students. But think more in the future in your career, uh, intellectual property and the protection of ideas out there in the world of technology. And there's, uh, so we're going to talk about what it is, what it means, and what it means to organizations. Here in college, it's, you're probably mostly hitting it when you think of uh, plagiarism. But it's way bigger than that. When you write software, you want to be able to sell it. You don't want other people stealing your ideas. How do you protect it? That's done using uh, copyright, trade secret laws. Plagiarism, that's claiming work that's, uh, Claiming that some work is yours when you've actually just copy-pasted someone else's writing. In terms of intellectual property, uh, is it legal? Uh, what are the limits of reverse engineering? Figure out how someone made something uh, and then make it yourself based on how you think someone else made it. Can you reverse engineer software? Is there uh, laws against that? Open source, there's a whole movement of making software free and available. And they've add, added some, what do they say? If you agree to use open source, you agree to, to have it uh, stay open source. There's a copy left that they call it. And what's competitive intelligence, which is generally seen as legal, compared to industrial espionage, implying illegal and how do you gather that 
And a little topic on cyber squatting. I'm not sure why that was squeezed into this chapter. To me, it seems like a, a separate topic. So intellectual property. Here is the general definition of intellectual property is works of the mind, ideas that you've had, that you put some work into by through your hard work and experimentation, or you came up with because you have an innovative, uh, you put two ideas together and came up with something distinct. But it doesn't have to necessarily be one person. It could be a group of researchers come up with an idea. And the idea is so valuable that you can sell products based on this idea. Or uh, use this idea to for others to use in their products. And because you put hard work into it, the idea is you should be fairly compensated. So the idea, the ethics behind, I would say, are... Uh, things that you've worked hard to do should be something that you get compensated for. Now, what do you think about that? You've worked hard for an idea. You came, studied hard. You came up with an idea. Should you have the right to be paid or other, be, other people pay you for using your idea? What do you think? Oh, good question. If they came up with it independently. Uh, so there's a there's an issue here that uh, if that gets into trade secret. Distinct usually means it's something completely different than someone else has done already. So there's a term with, with intellectual property called prior art. If things have been done already, maybe it hasn't been actually patented or copyrighted, but it's general knowledge. That's what the patenting office has to decide. Are you coming up with something new, or is that something everybody already knows, and you're claiming it is yours now? So that word distinct is a big legal term, and the people at the patent office or the trademark office have to understand the technology to know whether it's distinct. But idea that coming up up independently is a big deal. You need proof of that. So regarding intellectual property, if you think, here's the advice from an old guide for you guys with great ideas, future ahead of you. As you come up with ideas, as you do some research on things that might be might be new, and you may you may not even know that you're doing something new until you're in the middle of it. I would say just strongly. Get yourself a notebook that's bound, uh, not not three ring bound, but a notebook with with uh, binding and numbered pages. You can either number them manually. It's better to actually have them numbered already. And as you come up with ideas, even just software algorithms, make a habit of writing them down and regularly sign each page. With intent, do it all intent. You can even paste uh, pages of your software in there, but make sure it's a glue that uh, is permanent. That glue, and regularly have a friend maybe initial pages to confirm the date. If you come up with a great idea, having proof that you worked on it at a certain date will give you protection against someone claiming you stole their idea. So if you have possibly some ideas, and I think with your young minds, that's a definite possibility, keep a notebook of your thoughts and ideas. I love the uh, notebooks with blank pages. I don't like the lines. I like to draw pictures as well as write things. You can go to any bookstore that has a blank notebook. They're pretty popular these days. Have your name in it, name, or sign and date every page. Just make it a habit. I got into this habit uh, before working for 3M Company, which is known for innovation. When I got there, they actually delivered to everyone that worked at 3M a technical notebook that has numbered pages, and you are uh, expected. It's not something that uh, is regularly done, but our supervisors would occasionally say, how is your technical notebook going? And you would show them that you're actually keeping ideas in your notebook. And 
keeping the pages signed. There was a person in our group. She was the she was the one that would review technical notebooks throughout the company, and uh, she was very meticulous. If you didn't do something right, she tell you, hey, you got to change this or adjust this. She's very good, and I, it's amazing how much detail she would look over. But that's a very important. If you want to protect ideas you have, you need to keep a notebook signed and dated on every page, numbered pages, to show that those were your ideas. Uh, there's guys that work with, uh, who is the Facebook guy? Duncan Burr? Remember that idea was back in college. That was a college idea. There were friends that worked with Duncan Burr that they didn't. They kind of had a discussion. I don't know if anyone wrote anything down of what was what, what idea. Until they were making big money, then they said, wait a minute, why am I getting paid? And they went back and I don't know what kind of notes they took or protection they had, but that was big money that they lost because they couldn't prove that they were actually part of that original Facebook idea that built into a huge social media thing. That might be something you come up with. Keep a notebook, sign a notebook. That will help protect you from someone claiming you weren't involved with that idea or that it was their idea and not yours and you you are sued for, for using it. So there's the definition of intellectual property. Generally, uh, works... Creative works, distinct or owned by, single, by you, by a single person, or a group. The government, because we feel that there's a important ethical issues about protecting creativity. So in this chapter, the I would say the ethical reasons for copyright is mostly utilitarian. There are some ideas of, you know, if you do work, you should be paid for doing work. That's more of a principle. But utilitarian as well. If people aren't paid for doing their work, they won't continue to do good work. So the good of society will, you know, society advancing won't, be, won't uh, continue. So that's a utilitarian idea. But the principle of, hey, I work, I should be compensated for hard work. Well... Let's see what laws are in place and how they're defined. And the, the China question is going to come up in a little bit. But uh, uh, the, the, opening, the opening vignette, a little story at the beginning of the chapter, is about a company that was doing business in China. And they had electronic controls in windmills that they spent millions of dollars developing. But in a few years, suddenly their orders were dropping and they discovered someone had actually reverse engineered or stolen software to develop uh, competitive windmills control. It was discovered after uh, China started having trouble with the, the grid that it was uh, disturbed by you know, trees falling over wires and the system wasn't quite responding uh, optimally. They were blaming this company, and they realized, wait a minute, that's not our software that's running. Where did that come from? And they discovered uh, people stealing their software. Well, and we'll come in. We'll come to that. Uh, now, the copyright is uh, some is a your exclusive right to use, perform, produce some original work. It's mostly creative things. So patents are more applied to things I can build, where copyright applies to written works, a novel, uh, artwork, music, and software. They didn't know what to do, quite do with software because it works with machines and computing and controlling a computer, so it feels like something built. You compile it, but yet there's creativity involved. So software kind of fell in an unknown area until they've strengthened uh, the software laws regarding software. So, bio, so copyright basically applies to software as well because there's creativity in there. The software, laws about software are like laws about plagiarism.
there is a limit to the copyright and the time limits depending on your copyrights the time limit for how long the copyright protection is there uh, I think oh, I forget the term is it I think it's 70 years now it used to be like 20 years they've been they've had but there are limits on copyright they don't last forever it becomes a uh, public domain after a while in the copyright uh, and this applies to your uh, question number five down there the criteria for fair use of something there is copyright laws that you can't blatantly copy something of someone else's creative work but because if there's reasons to use it without stealing it or benefiting from it there are fair use laws for while you're allowed to use copyrighted material for a limited time so that's the fair use doctrine and we don't have the four criteria there but I think they're coming up because software falls or similar to creative works software copyright is similar to regular copyright uh, and one thing about software copyright is that uh, you have to have some proof of violation if you can only explain that they had to have copied your software uh, they couldn't they didn't come up with it on their own things like is it the exact spelling and variable names used in the in the source code that would be a strong indication that was a copy paste you didn't come up with that on your own <clears throat> there are software packages that you can buy that make it hard to reverse engineer software and here's some uh, various laws that have been put in place to protect intellectual property there was a <clears throat> fairly recent 2008 pro IP basically giving you uh, more penalties more for violation so uh, teeth in the law higher penalties for breaking copyright there's a tariff uh, the GATT Act it doesn't give a year on that again international trade as the company as the world has gone more global in the economy there's world trade uh, you can you can apply for a world patent so a law back in 94 basically giving some protection to, to patent something throughout the world before that you had to patent into the countries that you want to sell your stuff if you wanted a US patent and sell your property in the US you have to apply for a US patent sell it in another country you have to apply for a patent in that country big pain for the global economy so in the, in the 90s they strengthened laws regarding world patents and that was the world property intellectual property organization I'm not gonna have to worry about you memorizing all these laws but just to see the progress in the laws are becoming more global the world intellectual property organization so people across the world are saying there's value in businesses wanting to do business globally businesses have had a you know organized a world protection of patents okay so more more summary of the various protection uh, look quickly at it that computer programs are considered literary works because there's creativity in there even sound recordings you can have some control over the use of theirs the rental of theirs this is something that people violate all the time copying CDs that's pretty much laws are ignored by a lot of people in copyright for artistic works and most people don't feel at all uh, a problem with you know just copying someone's CDs and sharing that mp3 that is an actual violation of copyright and the only reason you haven't been sued is you don't have enough money to, for people to make it worth their time you never know someone may decide to make an example of you if you're blatantly copying somebody's music so be careful about that uh, if you're working for a company your company becomes liable if they uh, if you're using their equipment or if they should have known you were doing this they can get sued and lose big money you can either your company can lose a lot of money or can they, they can decide to just decide to fire you so be careful about that 
got three areas of property here to keep in mind about this particular slide is copyright uh, protects uh, most creative works. It's the easiest type of protection to have. And a cool thing about copyright, you don't even have to file a copyright to actually have copyrights to the work you're doing. If you do file it as a copyright, say you've, you've written a poem, or you've written a song, or you've written a software that you feel is unique, if you file that with a copyright office and you find someone else has copied it, you have more possibility of getting paid more and penalizing someone for stealing your idea. If you haven't copyrighted at all, it is still yours, but you may not be able to get as much compensation if someone's found stealing it. Patent has a little more teeth in it. It costs more to get a patent, takes more work. You hire lawyers to help you file the patent. You have um, stronger uh, economic compensation if someone's found stealing using your patent. Trade secrets. Here's the interesting thing with trade secrets. If you have an idea, but you don't want to tell the world. The thing is, if you, if you file a patent or copyright, you're giving a copy to someone of what you've done. To say, hey, here's what I've made. Someone can figure out and reverse engineer what you've done from your patent because your patent has to say how you did something. So people that don't want either way, other people in the world to know how they made it but yet want protection can file a trade secret. You keep it secret, but you say, I've got a secret. Here's what it is. And let, just to let the world know, if someone else comes with up, up with that Coke formula, that's a trade secret, they can't say to us, hey, you can't, you can't use that formula. Even if they come up, with on our, come up with the formula on their own, they can't come to us and say, hey, you're violating our patent. We can say, no, look, we've had it for years. You can't keep us from doing it. We already had that idea. Trade secret doesn't keep other people from you doing it. They keep other people from preventing you from using your idea. So the patents give you the right to prevent others from creating and copying. You have to go through a big filing process and it is expensive, it takes some time because you have to do research on the prior art. And this is where you can make big money as a patent lawyer if you know the technology, you can help people write patents and get paid $200 an hour for, for corporations for you to help them protect their, their patents. Big, big money. China is not seen as a very good country that protects patents. And there's a short little video talking about China. We'll skip that. The U.S. and China talking trade business. Talks ahead of the Korean Peninsula meeting. This is ongoing with 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 China and Trump. We are watching Asia. Previous administrations as well. Capital management founder Kyle Bass and Kyle, you are invested in China in Hong Kong. Talk to us first about what you've witnessed in terms of the U.S.'s stance against China and what China does in terms of intellectual property theft. Uh, as well as this trade deficit, $375 billion deficit with the U.S. Right. So you know, if, you look at the, if you look at the U.S., you know, uh, current account balance, which, uh, are, you know, trade, balance of trade is, is one of those key inputs and, and the key driver. Um, we are basically seeding, uh, we think, about $450 billion a year of our wealth uh, to mostly Southeast Asia, a little bit to Mexico. Uh, and I think that our policy with China uh, really, since China, we allowed China to ascend to the WTO in 2001, uh, has been one of, a, of basically being a pacifist. And it goes all the way back to, to Nixon and Kissinger. Uh, it accelerated under Reagan uh, and, and uh, Clinton and Bush and Obama. So this is a nonpartisan issue where we've just allowed China to run huge trade imbalances with the U.S. First, what was happening was a labor arbitrage. It was just cheaper to make things over there. And over time, what China's done so masterfully is they play the long game. And not only do they run a giant trade imbalance with us, but they steal our intellectual property. So whether you look at the IP Commission report, which is a bipartisan uh, uh, commission that was uh, put together under President Obama, 
or if you look at the Council of Economic Advisors or the Department of Defense reports over the last, call it 12 months, there's a consensus that IP theft from China uh, or from the U.S. to China uh, has been right around three to five hundred billion dollars a year. Three to five hundred wow. billion. Yeah, that's and a big so the, it's 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 actually a number that's unconscionable. Mm -hmm. And yet the the narrative that China develops in the press with this, you know, we are an open society, mm -hmm. we're an open economy, and we need to uh, continue globalization and free trade. What China is saying is we need to keep stealing as much as we can from you. We need to keep running the largest trade deficit that we can. And, and basically, we're going to be put into a servile nation if we don't act. Yeah. And I applaud uh, the efforts of, of, of Lighthizer, Trump, Mnuchin, uh, uh, and Wilbur Ross, and everyone that's actually just getting tougher with them. Yeah. And so I know, I know it's hard to say, well, the economics suggest that we should just keep buying cheap things from China. But the national security implications and the sovereign implications are so large right. that we need to wake up and, and, and applaud what they're doing. And, and that's why the, the U.S. blocked a deal between Qualcomm and Broadcom. There were national security issues around that deal. And China participates in about 10 or 11 percent of all venture capital deals. This was, when I was working at 3M until 2000, this was pretty much known throughout the corporation that if you filed a patent, don't expect it to be honored in China. Yeah. Knockoffs. Yeah. And they'll they'll even they'll even blatantly just put the the product name there. They won't even say, "Hey, this is our brand," but copy they, they'll put uh, Rolex on these on these cheap watches there's no well there's little or no penalty for them therefore why not do it and there's they're making big money and 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 you notice what they were they're careful not to not to say just Trump because you know Trump has with some people it just brings out I hate Trump I'm not gonna listen to you but they mentioned this current administration that being tough on China mentioned several times it's a bipartisan thing it's valuable to our country so uh, that's something that's going to be going on and it happens with software and hardware uh, you go to go you know, to uh, what's the tool store uh, yeah so many things made in China people that use tools always often mention oh they're made in China very cheap but it looks looks like the same thing but you start using it, it breaks down a lot quicker well they can convince people to buy it they don't they don't care how how necessarily the quality of it so with a patent you do have to disclose how you made something and that's the danger you can file it in the world patent you're basically saying hey China here's how I made this they'll say well, yeah we promise not to copy that sure file the patent and two years later, someone's making the exact same thing, even even claiming it's yours. Legal protection, maybe if we're tough, they will mark, they will start applying, uh, enforcing laws because it's economically important for them. Let's jump ahead to, uh, well, that question two. Theft, what additional evidence would convince you that China's theft of technical technological secrets represents a national strategy? than just a series of isolated incidents. What would convince you? This is, it seems to be a, nat a national strategy, not just a few people in China. But it's just happening all the time. So yeah, so the, the constant Ongoing theft, no process, very little prosecution of obvious uh, stealing. Yeah, and in that in that beginning story, also in the courts, if the Chinese courts, when you bring it to court, they're constantly rejecting claims that would tell you, hey, this is more than just one person. It's every court you go to in the country. They're very, they're rejecting the claims for infringement. That's telling you it seems like it's, it's a strategy. 
And I think the evidence is pretty strong, at least from you, you see our uh, document or uh, interviews like that. Everyone pretty much is convinced China, it's their strategy. What they, make, what they say, they're there for the long haul. They want basically to gain intellectual. They're happy to steal ideas because they were behind back in the back in the seventies. They were trying to catch up, and how do you catch up? Send a lot of students, college students, to the U.S. For, to learn the technology, but to get there faster, if they can come home with ideas and not have to spend ten years to come up with the idea. There's another way to get catch up with technology. If you if people are willing to give you technology if you pay them enough money. Go ahead, let them get in trouble for it. And there have been uh, people that, you know, high up in the, in the administration, even military secrets have been claimed to have been taken by China. One statement that I've been making regularly is that by 2025, or by, by 2020, I think I was saying, China is going to have better military planes. They're gonna, we're going to discover one of their planes flies faster than us or is better. And they may, maybe right now have something like that. Well, they say that right now in the news. That China and Russia supposedly have better militaries than us. Now, if we could just convince them it's to their advantage to be nice to us, maybe we could avoid the conflict. But there's going to be some conflict in the world that China's going to say, no, you're not going there. That island in the next to Singapore, that ours and, and U.S., you can't do anything about it. But we'll see, depending on how tough our administration wants to be, whether there will be some kind of military conflict. It's hard to it's hard to see it happen coming. We think we think with the world power. Okay, so question question three. What actions could Western countries take to protect the loss of secrets? What's the what's about the only thing we could do? <laughs> military You gotta you gotta make it economically uh, not um, not profitable for them. Either we have better protection here, bigger penalties for people giving away ideas to China. We could cut off trade, and that's something you know that make it higher cost to for China to try to you know if they do steal ideas, we make it hey you can't sell that here because I think they make their money by selling it in our country mostly. The market is growing in India and, and Japan and Europe. Yeah, their economy is kick in. So it seems like somehow we have to increase the penalties for stealing it. I don't, I don't know. Besides the military intervention, you got to you got to make it you know, either decrease trade in, or increase the cost of trade with China, or enforce the laws with stronger penalties. How about that fourth question? What's the difference between competitive intelligence and industrial espionage? We would generally, I would generally say competitive intelligence is doing research to find out how they might be doing something uh, without stealing ideas, without breaking privacy laws to find out how people are making something. How your competitor is working. If you can just if you can figure out the Coca-Cola formula just by seeing the public information about what they're buying for supplies, then that's competitive intelligence. If you hire someone to break into their company to measure the recipe, that's espionage. So it's espionage, illegal, competitive intelligence is the legal ways to figure out how to help something be made. It's almost like reverse engineering. If you can look at software, see how it works, and say, you know, I think this is what they must be doing, you're using competitive intelligence. Now, there's a fuzzy line, there's a gray line. Is it reverse engineering? You can do reverse engineering, but when you bought the software, part of the user license was you do not reverse engineer or attempt to reverse engineer the software. That is in many of the end user license agreements. So if you try to reverse engineer, you're breaking the contract, the promise.
promise that you made when you bought it, even though you probably didn't read it, that yes, you will not attempt to reverse engineer it. So that's where then, I don't know if I'd call it espionage, I'd call it breach of contract. You signed the agreement and yet you're, you're breaking that promise to not try to reverse engineer it. I don't think I, I thought I had a four, four criteria for pick for uh, fair use. Let's see if I can find that here. This is where trade secrets. Looking for the fair use. I don't think I, I thought I came up. See when I had the four. There was mention of copyright. Four criteria for fair use. I guess I'm not giving that to you directly here in the slide here. Uh-oh. Better look that one up. I thought I had a slide with those. Maybe, maybe I have to come up with a slide. Uh, copyright, uh, fair use, four rules. Let's see. Okay. I've got this one link here. Let's see here. Here, okay. So it's sort I guess it's these words. It's the purpose of the work, the nature of the work, the amount that you're using, that's not mentioned there, and the effect on the copyrighted work. Okay, so the the first criteria for for uh, fair use is what are you? What's your purpose of it? If it's educational, you're not making a profit. And it's uh, strictly for education. The purpose would be the first criteria. Second criteria is the nature of the work. Let's see if they mention what the nature of the work. Uh, I'll explain what they mean by that. The, the type of work it is. Uh, playing the music, uh, reading the poem. The relation, what do they mention that? How much, how much of the work is being used? So three, the relation is how much of it. You can't copy the entire textbook. There's a limit to how many pages you can copy and use. But still, the plagiarism laws come in effect. Even if you use a small portion of it, you still, to not be plagiarizing, you have to say, this was attributed to this person that wrote this poem that I'm putting in my paper. You still, no matter how how much you use, you still have to attribute it, otherwise they can accuse you of plagiarism. If you use so much of it, it's plagiarism and copyright uh, violation by using so much of it. And the line gets fuzzy, again, how much, depending on how much money you have for someone to decide to come after you. The biggest part is, are you damaging the person from being able to sell their product more by using it and that's very clearly a violation when you're copying somebody's music instead of paying for it. Clearly, there's damages there. The person lost a sale because you gave a copy of that music to your friend. You can say, well, I'm a poor college student. I wouldn't have bought it anyway, so they're not losing money, but they can still come after you because the effect of you using it on the loss of a sale by the person that made that. So those are the four rules. The purpose are using it for something like education, how much of it you're using, uh, the nature of the copyright, of the thing being copyrighted, like the picture. Uh, you're not posting it on your, on your advertisement and, and your sales literature. It just happened to be a picture uh, on your desk. How much of it you use. Things that cannot be patented. 
things that are known by everyone already. Prior art. Those are the kind of things that cannot be patented. You cannot patent so much creati creativity, that's if, as far as you can go with an artwork or something, is a copyright. You can... Uh, and you can you can't patent ideas. You have to you can patent the uh, implementation of an idea, how you implement an idea. You can't just patent an idea of uh, the idea of making fuel from making uh, energy from water. That's a great idea. How it's done can be patented. The idea of making it energy from water. You can't say, well, no one else can do that because I just patented that idea. Sorry, people. There are, and that's where the lawyers come in when someone's trying to say, wait a minute, you can't, you can't tell us, we can't do, uh, there was a famous person that said, you know, just taking pictures from cameras and processing them to, to do like face recognition. They wanted to basically patent anything to do with recognizing people's faces in cameras. It's a fairly unique idea, but it's now become pretty much common prior art. Everyone does it. But someone that came up with that idea back in the 60s, well, that seems like a fairly unique idea. And actually, somebody did come up with that idea and patented those kind of things back in the 60s and started coming back to companies in the 90s saying, wait a minute, we patented this way back when. Can you pay us some money because you're doing facial recognition with cameras? We, we thought of that idea way back. And there was a lot of legal fights uh, for that. Uh, Oh, there's a Formula One. I do I have that. I don't know if I have that picture. There's 3M had a Formula One image. Let's see if I have that down towards the end here. How to put that in a slide? Oh, I don't have it here. Let me see if I can bring that up. 3M and Formula One had similar images. I should have put that in a slide. Yeah, these are here's this here's the side of the images. Let me grab that, bring that over here. Stupid Windows click. There we go. Look at those two images. Here's a Formula One image. Here is a 3M product. Is Formula One violating 3M's copyright? Is this similar enough to 3M's product that Formula One should not be allowed to use that logo? What do you think? If, if I were a patent person, and I don't know if this came up in legal proceedings, I might say, well, what's the market for their product? Are they, are they selling the same kind of product? Formula One, I'm thinking that's a, like an oil yeah. additive. Yeah. 3M's Futuro is a is a like a, a, a product in the medical area. It's like completely different markets. That to me might say to the judge, well, you're really not in a, you're not really competing. Uh, and it's is it close enough? I mean, there's a little more space between that. Well, that one looks similar, but it's a black background instead of white background. The Formula One word isn't even over here. Is it close enough? I think it would be a matter of the judge's judgment. I think, I think I'd think i say, you know, they're not close enough, different markets. But Formula One, uh, maybe some kind of agreement with 3M. We didn't know. We came up with this on our own. We didn't copy yours. Could they claim, hey, this is a standard font we found out there, prior art. But this, comes, this kind of thing comes up regularly. Uh, I knew a guy that he was doing websites uh, selling classic cars. He had Auto in his name. AutoZone actually came after him, uh, claiming that he was cyber squatting, using a similar website name. He was in the area of automobile uh, use auto in his name. 
he was small enough that he couldn't fight it. And he finally had to say, okay, we, we can't use this name. It, was, it wasn't worth all the money to try to fight AutoZone. Hey, they're a big corporation. They could come and, and send lawyers after him and require him to answer legal uh, papers. So, man, we're out of time already. That was a quick review of intellectual property. Here's what I'll do. I will uh, I'll open up the the assignment, the next the next paper assignment. I'll send out an email of the requirements for that. Similar kind of paper, given a scenario, explain the ethical issues about a particular scenario. And I have some worksheets from. This one where we find a lot of terms, I thought that might, like, that might be helpful for review. There's just a two more. The last one will be kind of like a final. So they won't be piled on top of each other. So long. Yeah, turn in your worksheet from today.